O3 Pro is out. I've been testing AI models for years now. They're helpful, they're tactical, they've recently become strategic. I'm looking at you, Gemini 2.5 Pro, Claude 4, O3, but they have not yet been resonant. What I mean by that is they haven't yet been so on the money consistently with their perspective that their words stick in my head and just live rent free. That is what we are getting to with O3 Pro. I don't just mean they're good writers. What I mean by that is they're so insightful that I feel like I am profoundly known in the problems I am grappling with. So when I started to dig into O3 Pro, I wanted to give it, you know, an honest test. I wanted to give it something that would give me a sense of how it actually works. And so I picked three things where I felt like I could make an assessment. One was an assessment of that infamous Apple paper, and I wanted to stack it up against O3's assessment. One was a roadmap that I would share with the C-suite, and I wanted to pick a company I knew reasonably well. I picked Datadog. And one was a interesting algorithm optimization problem and I picked Wordle optimization. Now that's a fairly easy one if, if like you've done optimization problems, but I wanted to see like what it would do and how it would write it relative to what O3 would do. I looked at all three. In every single case, O3 Pro did better. And the reason why it did better surprised me. It was not that it was a longer answer. It was not even necessarily that it had all of the sections or was more complete. In fact, in one case, it was less complete than O3 and still won anyway. Do you know why? Because O3 went beyond its tool calling capabilities and O3 Pro knew when to stop and could explain why. That is a huge deal. This was a case where it was looking at Twitter mentions for the Apple thinking is an illusion paper. And it was looking at a very specific criteria around retweets with a certain number of likes. And it said, I can't get that out of my tool call right now. I'm just going to not mention it. Also, I'm near the word limit you imposed in the prompt. So it's not worth me going after. Both were correct. O3 phoned something in in a table and it looked plausible. It named real Twitter users who had really talked about the paper. But the table itself wasn't useful because it didn't specifically refer to the tweets because underneath the hood, O3 couldn't get to them. Now, I am not here to tell you that this is a perfect model. I do think it is the first model that can operate as a strategic advisor at the founder level without any caveats. Does that mean that I think it's the best founder advisor in the world? Didn't say that, did I? But the fact that we're even talking about that 48 days after O3 itself launched is a big deal. That is how fast project pro progress is going right now. O3 Pro is able to strategically understand very difficult, multi-dimensional, heavy context problems and come out with strategic insights that are correct and act as a sparring partner. This is a model that is hungry for context. I have made the mistake, even in the little bit of time I've been using it, of feeding it prompts where the context was too light. This is a model that seeks to understand like global thinking. It wants to think big. It will go get context. And if it goes and gets context that you didn't direct it to go and get, you're going to be surprised, perhaps unpleasantly, at what you find. And so my advice to you, which I've seen elsewhere around the web as people have played with O3 Pro, is that you should use this model for hard problems that you can give a lot of context to the model on. That is what it shines at. If you have a truly strategic conundrum, something you're wrestling with, you should be able to come up with a lot of context, either from your own head or from the web. And you should be able to feed it to the model, tell the model where to go, give the model constraints and warnings, and set the model up for a really successful, hard think. And I mean like a 15, 20 minute think. This is a get a sandwich while you wait 
kind of model experience. And I got used to that with O1 Pro, but the difference with O1 Pro is that O1 Pro felt like a complete essayist. It would come back with a very well written response, but O3 Pro comes back with the strategic insight that actually underlies that response. And is it more readable in O3? It actually is. One of the things I've noticed in the roughly six weeks I've been using O3 is that O3 is extremely technically intelligent and has real trouble dumbing that down into writing that is clear for non-technical audiences. And I say dumbing that down because I think O3 thinks of it that way. O3 has trouble simplifying prose into plain English a fair bit. O3 Pro is much better at it. If you ask it for a plain English summary of a very technical topic, you are likely to get a better result out of O3 Pro. Now, that is not a full measure of intelligence. There are other models out there that do that very well. Sonnet 4 is a phenomenal writer. It just is. I've been playing with it a bit and have been struck by how Opus and Sonnet really have a good one-two punch when it comes to thinking about hard problems with Opus and then writing well with Sonnet. And I guess that's as good a bridge as any to talking about model comparison. This is unquestionably, O3 Pro is unquestionably a model in a class of its own. I get asked a lot, is X the best model in the world? And then people will throw out a name like Grok 3, Opus 4, O3, uh, Deep Seek, whatever it is. Gemini 2.5 Pro. I feel very good after playing with this, telling you that O3 Pro is unquestionably the biggest and best model on the planet right now, and it's not close. However, I do not think a lot of people will understand or appreciate it, partly because they're releasing it only on the Pro and the team's plans. And I think they'll bring it down because the unit economics seem to be much more favorable with O3 Pro. They released O3 Pro for 87% less than O1 Pro. But even if they bring it down into the lower tiers, this is still a model that takes prompting carefully. You need to be thoughtful about the problems you hand this model. It's like driving a Ferrari. If you drive it well, it's going to do a phenomenal job on amazing roads and you'll have a great time. If you take it to the grocery store, you'll regret it. And if you drive it on bad roads, you'll just blow it up. And I will say there are ways you can make this model quote unquote blow up. I don't mean actually malfunction, but I mean, I have found that when I have just attached a document and asked it to summarize the document, it doesn't do a super great job at that because it is unable to restrain itself from being a global thinker and bringing in extra context. And by the way, people are probably going to call that habit hallucinations. And I think that is probably incorrect. And I'll explain why. Hallucinations, if we look at them the way we name weeds in gardens, weeds is just an undesired plant. A hallucination is just an undesired thought from a model, right? Whatever you want to call it. In this case, I think it's actually very intentional on OpenAI's part to launch a model that is a true global thinker because they need that on the path to AGI. So that part makes sense. I think the challenge is because it gathers context from across the web and it is difficult to understand what all the sources were that it got a hold of. It is hard to know at first glance whether the numbers it is giving you and the facts it is giving you in a response are absolutely correct, every single one of them, or whether some of them might be made up. And it is so persuasive and so clean in its prose and so insightful you won't get the feeling intuitively that the numbers are made up. They won't sit out to you and like jump out and say, oh, this is a made up number the way they have in the past. You will have to do your checking. And so I would think this is the first model where it is probably going to end up being malpractice not to check the model's response with another model before publication. 
if you're going to go to an executive, if you're going to go to the internet with a model's output, it is on you to use another model to help you check because the number of things that is looking at is kind of too high at this point for a human to fact check individually, unless you have hours and hours and hours and hours. And part of what we're using these models for is that they save us time. Like this is better than McKinsey strategy decks I've seen. Like this is truly a executive level strategic thinking model. And so I guess if you bring that back around to where I started, you have an executive strategic model in your pocket. It is picky about prompting. It is a global thinker. You have to expect it to be one. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to prompt it? What are the problems that you are going to give it? And I deliberately want to point out that I do not think that just because this model is capable of this level of strategic thinking, that does not mean everyone is going to go out, use this model for strategic thinking, and make all consultants go away. Partly because no matter how good this model is, it is not going to be able to understand the hidden depths of quiet context, the vibe in your office, the way you do, and the way a consultant does if they really sit down with you. And honestly, partly because people are kind of lazy and don't always actually use the capabilities that are in front of them. And so imagine this as like an incredibly powerful home cooking machine that has magically arrived in all of our homes or soon will. We're still going to go out to eat at restaurants. We still want to order in shrimp lo mein or poke or sushi sometimes, even if the magical cooking machine can do a phenomenal job because we're human. And that's actually a point that Sam Altman made. He intentionally published an essay today called The Gentle Singularity, where he talked about the fact that a lot of what humans care about is going to continue to exist in the 2030s. And yet at the same time, this takeoff into intelligence is going to continue to happen. And his thesis is essentially that we will have much more abundance, etc., because we let the intelligence happen. We will see how all of that plays out. Sam has the ability to actually drive some of that. You and I don't. Uh, we're just along for the ride. and It's helpful to understand what's going on. In my view, there's two big things that stand out that I want you to take away. One, it's been 48 days. I said it before. It's been 48 days since 03. We are going fast. 04 is around the corner. 04 Pro is coming. GPT-5 is coming. That is all from one model maker this year alone, plus the open source model they're going to release. There's other model makers right around the corner. I'm sure they're working out late tonight on O3 Pro. So things are going fast. Number two, yes, this is a model that is worth getting to know. It is the best model in the world. It needs an excellent, excellent problem. I am fully, like having talked to a lot of people in tech, outside of tech, we all grapple with problems that are really, really tough for us. It is worth it to have a strategic thinking partner. And I don't just mean for business, although I've spent most of this uh, video talking about the business side. On the Substack that I wrote about this, which you can check out if you like, I actually include a very simple prompt for people who find this model scary to get started. I'm gonna go ahead and read it here as well. Based on everything you know about me, what would make me 50% happier? I, if you have been talking to your chat GPT, give that to O3 Pro and see what a difference it makes. See what a difference it makes. It is a much more insightful model than O3. And I think that's where I'll leave it. Good luck uh, becoming 50% happier with O3 Pro.